Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, we made it out of 2020 alive. So to kick off the new year, we have a great interview guest, Jonathan Katz, who is one of the greatest trainers in the world. And I say this because he is the very few trainers that are titled um, SPSA3. Um, I'm gonna have Jonathan explain it because I'm a, a rookie in this subject. So we're gonna have the man himself explain what. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Happy New Year, how are you? Happy, good, Happy New Year to you. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank, thank you for having me. So I actually, um, before we dive into um, the PSA 3 d all that, I want to know your history and how you started getting involved with dogs, where that passion came from. So um, I was originally a chef. I went to culinary school. And um, I, long story short, I rescued a dog, was very aggressive. I hired a trainer to help me train that dog. And um, it was a huge waste of money. Um, the guy was not that great. And I was basically like, this can't be dog training. I also didn't know that there was a career training dogs. I wasn't uh, raised with dogs. I wasn't allowed to have a dog growing up. So I rescued this dog. I had to figure out how to train him. And um, in that process, you know, I just found a passion for it. I started rescuing dogs off the streets of Miami and, you know, rehabbing them and then finding them homes. And it just became such a passion. Mm -hmm. And where are you from originally? I was born and raised in New York City. Okay. And then I, I read a little bit about you, and I know that you spent some time in Israel. I did. Um, I, when I was 18, I, was, um, I went to school in Israel for the year, and I was standing in a square, um, and two blocks away, there was the largest suicide bombing in Israel. Um, and so... You know, it's very like, you know, it's very surreal for 18 year old kid to, you know, see the duality of man. And when I became a dog trainer, it was always my dream to go back to Israel and train bomb dogs. So um, I basically one day decide I can be impulsive sometimes. So I decided one day I'm just going to pick up, take my three dogs at the time and move to Israel and train dogs. That's awesome. Where in Israel were you? Uh, I was everywhere. Okay. Um you know, because of what I did, uh, my main job was I was a traveling instructor. So I basically went um, to work with handlers, you know, on the job, you know, help dogs get ready for certification, fix dogs that had lost their certification and, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, get the dogs ready to, to work on the streets. That's awesome. My uh, fun fact, my older brother actually lives in Israel. No way. Yeah. Where? Uh, he lives uh, an hour south of Tel Aviv. His okay, wife cool. at the university there. Oh, cool. Yeah. Have you been to visit? A, a few times, and I, I love it. It's, it's, it's a beautiful place. No matter what religion you are, you just, like, you feel the, you know, like, you just feel the spirituality. Yes. And um, my parents brought me many, I mean, I've, I've probably been to Israel, like, 12 times at this point. You know, my parents would bring me when I was younger to visit, you know, family and friends. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a gorgeous place. A lot of people, when I, when I talk to them, they're like, you're not scared to be there. I mean, honestly, Israel is like one of the safest places you can be. You know, right. especially everyone's walking around with guns, so you almost feel a little bit more secure. Mm -hmm. And I want to actually um, talk about that a little bit because culturally, um, I, I think uh, dogs play a more important role there. Um, in terms of, you know, the security. So um, how did uh, the work that you do there um, impact the people there and uh, like really hone your skills? Yeah, so I mean, um, all day, every day, I'm searching for, you know, for explosives and, um, you know, explosive making materials. So, you know, I take what I did very seriously um, you know, you're basically the last line of defense for something getting into the country, um, you know, and, uh, you know, like, 
you know, you're when you sit in intelligence briefings and they tell you like something gets through here and people die, it's your fault. You know, you I, I took it what I did very seriously in general, but you know, it's um, it even makes you you know more think about okay, well, you know, the the my actions are going directly a correlate to you know what happens. So, mm-hmm. um, very thankful to have a lot of live finds. Um, my dog Uzi live finds. Uh, we also worked for a little bit as uh, for the police as a patrol dog handler, and he had some live bites. So. You know, I, I definitely loved what I did because I was actively out there every day, you know, making a difference in the security of people's lives. So. Mm-hmm. And how long were you there? Uh, two years. And what brought, brought you back to the States? Uh, I got homesick. Uh, Hold on, you just cut out. Wait. You just cut out. I can't hear you. Mm-mm. Can you hear me? Okay. Please stand by, we're experiencing some technical difficulties. Hey. Hi, uh, you hear me now? Yes, we're back. Sorry, sorry about that. All good. Okay, so you were there for two years, got homesick. And just, you know, wanted to be closer to family and friends, and so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So w- when you came back, where did you go? Um, I went back, uh, I went to go work for a friend of mine in New Jersey to help him with his business. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, we train pet dogs, but also p- uh, protection dogs and police dogs. Um, mm-hmm. And then uh, from there, I ended up moving to Chicago. I lived in Chicago for just over three years. Um, I started a business. I had a huge facility. And unfortunately, I was basically became, you know, just a business owner. I wasn't actually training dogs. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to get away from that and, you know, get back to just actually training dogs. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I ended up moving back to New York, which was, you know, I really got homesick moving, you know, uh, close to family. And um, I now I'm uh, I'm a private trainer. So everything, every dog that's going to be trained is going to be trained with my hands. So. Mm-hmm. The, the reason why I'm focusing on your history is because it takes a very particular person to earn the, the titles that you have earned. Um, can you uh, explain what PSA 3, what the title means and what a dog and handler is required to do to earn that? So uh, when I first started in PSA, at the time, there were only six dogs that have ever been titled to PSA three. So, you know, those were very elite dogs. And, you know, I said, I want to be part of that club one day, you know, I want to, my whole life has always been, you know, I want to set out to do things that other people can't do. And my whole life, I was told by people that I wasn't capable of doing things. So Basically, my whole life, I've wanted to prove myself right, knowing that I'm capable of doing what I set my mind to. So at this point, there are now 24 dogs titled to PSA 3, um, and there's only 22 handlers. Um, So the creator of the sport, Jerry Bradshaw, he just closed out his three on his third dog. Um, And then um, the East Coast director, Janet Dooley, she has two dogs titled to PSA three. Um, and then now my dog Uzi was number 10. My dog Cougar was number 21. And then my dog Puma has her first leg, meaning that in PSA three, you have to do it twice uh, so that it can't be a fluke. Okay. Mm. But basically PSA three is 100% surprise scenario training. So when you show up to trial that day, you don't know what you're going to see. You know what core behaviors you need but you don't know what 
what the pictures are going to be and what order it's going to be. And, you know, it's all in the mind of the judge of what they can come up with. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely difficult because I can like give you a guideline of how to train for it, but I can't actually tell you 100% this is how you train for this because it's constantly changing and evolving. Mm -hmm. So we had a question from Harlow, Harlow Queen. Um, what makes the top dog successful? Is it the handler or is it the dog? It's the team. Um, especially for PSA, you need to have the right dog. And when it comes to doing any sort of specific uh, performance work with a dog, like you need to have the right dog. The dog is capable of doing the job that you're asking for it to do, you know? Um, you know, just like you're not going to take a lazy person and like you're not going to take them in and, you know, motivate them to run a marathon. Like it's just not going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So you definitely need, especially for PSA, you need a dog that's capable of taking all the pressure um, that the decoys are going to provide. Um, you know, like I need to be able to send my dog into find his way into a tent with four guys in suits. Uh, two guys have buckets of water. One guy's got a leaf blower and one guy's got a chainsaw with the blade taken off. And my dog has to come into this room. There could also be smoke bombs, right? Like my dog has to come into this room, find the person, find one of the guys, bite that guy, and then basically take the pressure from the all four of the guys at the same time. Okay. So it is a lot of pressure on the dog. If you train the dog properly, the dog loves it. You know, mm -hmm. my dog hears in, in the realm of protection, in, of protection, like, a decoy pull starts a leaf blower and my dog gets excited. They go into drive. Whereas a lot of dogs that would really make them nervous of a guy trying to blow a leaf blower at them. Mm -hmm. So okay. the, the team, it's really important on the team. You have to have the right dog and then the handler has to be motivated. Um, you know, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of hours that go into titling these dogs. And, you know, if you don't have the motivation, no matter how much motivation the dog has, you're never going to get there. Mm-hmm. You know, so definitely the handler has to be internally motivated. Mm -hmm. And um, what makes uh, a ha the handler, um, I mean, blood, sweat, and tears, just, you know, working and learning? A lot of blood, a lot of sweat, and a lot of tears. <laughs> so how long were you working with Uzi uh, to get him to that level? So, okay, so Uzi, I brought him with me when I went to Israel. Um, I had finished his bomb work and his patrol work. Um, we then worked for the government for two years. And then when we came back, so he was like three and a half. And basically from three and a half till I retired him at about nine, um, we were actively training for his PSA three title. Okay. Um, okay. So for uh, uh, someone that's not in the PSA world at all, can you describe what that's like for you, uh, like stepping onto the field and like going to an actual event? Um, so training a dog for competition, any competition you're going to do, you're basically going to train the dog for like a year to then step on the field for like maybe 10 minutes. So you have to truly enjoy um, you know, like you have to enjoy your, your training as opposed to like some people like, Oh, well, I would just want to trial my dog and it doesn't really work that way. You know, you have to truly enjoy the process. Um, but you know, realistically you're, you're part of a club, you're going to club at least twice a week, then you're doing training sessions at home. Um, you know, it's kind of a never ending process. And yet, as I said, you have to really love the process. Um, you know, to be able to go out and, you know, achieve what you're setting out to achieve. But as I said, if you explain this to like the average person, like, okay, so you're going to train your dog for an entire year and then you're going to go out and just like show your dog for 10 minutes. It doesn't sound like a, enough of a, um, a reward for all of that hard work, but because you're bonding with your dog and you're ultimately like just doing things with your dog and you're enjoying it, like that's, that's really the fun for me. Mm -hmm. um, so with that being said, um, obviously like if you're in the world, you get it, but if you're not, it's like totally foreign. You know, why would I want to, you know, train with my dog for 10 minutes? Like, 
Uh, what is it about? Oh, okay. The question is, why is it so hard to get involved with the club? Um, it's about finding the right club. Um, you know, it's about like every club is different, just like every trainer is different. And, you know, when I first started, I've been part of a lot of clubs and I've been part of a lot of clubs that of people that, you know, said they were serious, but weren't serious. Um, you know, ultimately like people, people don't do their, their, their homework when they're supposed to do it. And then they want to rely on their training director as like, okay, like it's a direct correlation of my training director, whether my dog's going to be titled or not. And it's, it's not the case. The training director is there's just there to guide training and, you know, help you on your journey, but ultimately you have to do it yourself. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've been part of clubs or I've had clubs where, you know, uh, club members, like their dog didn't do well and they expected, you know, that it was my fault. Right. And, you know, that's really, unfortunately, like that's not the, that's, that's not fair to me because I only see the dog, you know, twice a week for, you know, a few hours at a time, you know, they're spending all day, every day with the dog. So, you know, to blame me because you didn't do your homework is not really fair. Right. And, you know, I obviously take my training seriously. So I want to train with people that are serious about what they're doing. Right. So when I moved back to New York, I started a club. Well, Everyone said, Jonathan, start a club. And I said, eh, you know, I'm not going to start a club because, uh, you know, I don't know how serious everyone's going to be just because I'm, I'm unfortunately a little bit um, jaded on someone saying, you know, I'm serious for me. They have to show it to me. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with dogs. Like it's about physically showing actions and showing the dog, you know, what you expect of them. Like, you know, it's the same thing for people. So I moved back to New York and I started a group class and I started a group class because I said at any moment I can cancel this class. If I'm not happy doing it, I'm not going to do it. And um, I started with about 12 people. And of those 12 people, I basically took three of them, kicked the other people out and started a club. Mm, okay. Because those, the people that I kicked out were inconsistent. They would show up late. They would leave early. Um, you know, they didn't have goals in mind. They just wanted to, for me to come out and me to tell them what they're supposed to do with their dog. Um, so I ultimately really only wanted to train with serious people. So my club is my off time, right? It's when I'm training my own dogs, you know, I train dogs for a living. So, but my hobby is also training my personal dogs. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, I only wanted to train with like-minded people and, um, you know, We've now put, you know, we've now built a, a strong club. We have about 10 club members, but, you know, every person in that club was basically hand selected to be in there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm trying to build a, you know, a, a winning team, right? You know, I want everyone to want to compete at a national level um, and to compete at the highest level. And whether they get there or not is, you know, kind of irrelevant, right? To me, it's the dedication and the, the time and effort that people put into their own dogs. Mm -hmm. Because for shit sure, like I'm putting the time into my dogs, right? right. I expect my club members to, to put, you know, just as much time in. Mm -hmm. It's a true sport and the dogs and handlers are athletes. Yeah. And if you want to be, again, if you want, what's the saying is if you want to be really good at something, spend 10,000 hours practicing it. You know, mm -hmm. um, so like you got to you just got to put the hours in, you know, unfortunately, nowadays with with the Internet and social media, um, it's very easy for dog trainers to, um, you know, what I call like mimicry. Like I watch someone do something. So then I'm just going to mimic that. And they don't actually understand the basis of why they're doing what they're doing and they can't explain it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's easy to copy but it's very hard to like actually understand why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's why it's like one of my favorite things to do is travel the country and give seminars because I love, I love coaching people and I love working with people and their dogs. And, you know, but honestly, even when it comes to pet, pet dogs, like I train pet dogs. Right. But if someone is not serious and they're not going to take the training seriously, like, honestly, I have no desire to work with them. 
Mm -hmm. because everything I do is through referrals and, you know, a well-trained dog is going to get you referrals, right? A a non-well-trained dog is going to be like, ah, you know, who helped you train that dog, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, again, I, I, I take what I do very seriously depending on whether we're training pets or I'm training police dogs. Um, and I expect everyone else, you know, to, to take it seriously around me. So. Mm-hmm. So just as a handler, um, may blame a trainer, uh, like, Oh, I, I didn't learn anything. You know, I'm not getting anywhere. Um, how does the handler, uh, blame the dog? Do you see that? You can't blame the dog. You can't ever blame the dog because the dog is a direct correlation of you and the dog will only do what's in their own best interest, which is, and it's your best interest to motivate them to do. So it's never the dog's fault. Never, ever. It's always the person's fault. A hundred percent. So um, we, we hear a lot about um, dogs being washed. Uh, why does that happen? And like, when is it too early for a dog? <sighs> so that's a, it's a good question. Um, it's, uh, I'll give you my opinion is 90, again, this is just a, uh, I'm giving you a gross number, but like 90% of all the dogs that are washed are from inexperienced handlers. Okay. People that have never titled the dog, never done anything with the dog, expect that their brand new puppy is going to be perfect. It is never going to have any issues. It is never going to be nervous of anything. And it's never going to, like, everything they're ever going to do is perfect. And if the dog is not perfect, they're a wash. Bullshit. Because there's no such thing as a perfect human. So you can't tell me that there's a perfect dog. Mm-hmm. Right? So the average person, I, okay, I've been training dogs for 18 years. I've been breeding Malinois for 12 of those years. In my entire career, I have washed three dogs. One was a Malinois that I only kept him because he was very aggressive. um, And I just didn't like his temperament. I bred him. um, But like my Malinois, or if you meet a Malinois puppy and they're like showing like serious, like this dog at four months old was trying to seriously hurt people. He wasn't like, oh, I'm being a puppy and I'm just biting you. Like, no, no, no. He he had bad intentions. Um, And then I had a Lacanois. Um, which is like a wire-coated Malinois. They're very rare. Um, that was kind of like an impulse buy. I was like, ah, it's cool. I want one, um, you know. And then uh, I had another dog, like, but, you know, of, of the hundreds of dogs I've raised, I've washed three, and it was all for temperament, you know. A couple of them, like, weren't aggressive enough for the protection side, right, because the dog does have to have, you know, some sort of aggression, um, you know. So, like... I see a lot of dogs, unfortunately, getting washed out by people that have no experience. Because if you were good at selecting the dog, then you should be okay with training the dog that you selected. Mm-hmm. And, right? uh, and how do you select a dog in a, with the litter? Like with um, the, the first thing that you do is you find a good breeder that is going to help you on your journey that is going to help you select the right dog for the right handler. Um, What I always tell my like potential puppy buyers, I'm like, just be prepared that like, you're basically married to me for the next, you know, 10 to 15 years of this dog's life because I brought this dog into the world and like, I need to make sure that it's okay. And so like, I want to know how it's doing. I want to be updated Um, you know, like if there's something wrong with the puppy, I want to replace it, you know, um, like I'm, I'm very involved in the dogs that I breed. And that's why I'm also super particular of where my dogs go, you know, Mm -hmm. because as I said, it's my, I I look at it as I brought them into this world. They had no say into where they go. So I have to do my due diligence and, and all of my work to make sure that they're with the right person. Mm-hmm. But I'm also, excuse my French, but I'm the motherfucker that'll show up at your house. If I find out you're abusing one of my dogs, like I will drive there. Like mm-hmm. I, dr- I drove from Chicago to, to New Mexico to come and, and rescue a dog back, you know? Um, like, again, like I'm these dogs advocates, so I have to be there to, to stand up for them. Mm-hmm. And how do you, how do you know that something was off, that there was abuse going on? <sighs> I mean, abuse is all relative. So, 
you know, mental abuse, physical abuse, like honestly, just keep taking a, a, a happy go lucky Malinois puppy and keeping it in an outdoor kennel for, for a year of its life. Like to me, that's abuse, you know? Um, so, you know, if I find out that it's not, you know, like if the person doesn't love the dog, there's something wrong there. Mm -hmm. Right. Because again, like I, I love my dogs. Like I want, you know, if it's my dog, like I love it, you know, like I, and, and I want all my puppy buyers to, to love their dogs. And if they're not loving the dog, like here's the, the key thing. When people contact me about buying puppies, my number one rule is when that dog, if that dog ever leaves your side, it has to come back to me. You can't sell it. You can't give it to your uncle or your aunt because they love it. Cause it's not working. Cause if it's a wash, I need to get it back so I can find out why did you wash it? A lot mm -hmm. of times dogs are washed from shitty training, mm -hmm. right? So I've gotten multiple dogs back that were washouts and like my dog Puma, right? That I just won national vice champion with. And she was 2017 national champion. Like that dog was a wash from an IPO from a Schutzen home. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's the woman said, Oh, this dog's not strong enough to, to do IPO. Well, I took the dog back and I put a PSA one, a PSA two, and now first leg of a PSA three, like, yeah, mm -hmm. is the dog a wash or is just the handler not know what they're doing? Mm -hmm. You know, so. Want to know. Um, so when I want to touch on the, um, the abuse that we're talking about, because a lot of people are getting Malinois and, you know, they're amazing dogs, obviously we're biased here um yeah. can you talk about uh how that is abuse um having a, a mal um just be in the backyard all day long and not having that um handler uh interaction or owner interaction it to me i equate it i again one is an inanimate object and one is a living breathing thing but it would be the same for me as like buying a sports car and then just keeping it sitting in my garage and not doing anything with it you know, like that dog was bred to move and to train and to work all day, every day. You know, police dogs and military dogs, like my dog Uzi and I, we would work, you know, we'd work 8, 10, 12 hour days. Like the dog worked for 12 hours. Now he would rest in between working. But, you know, we, him and I once worked a 36 hour day. Like literally in between searches, we would both take naps. You know what I'm saying? So to buy a dog that you understand what they need in life and to then not give it to them to me is abuse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and, and then here is my problem is Malinois are amazing dogs and in the right home, like they can, they can thrive. But unfortunately we come from uh, like America is the, the land of the free and the home of the brave and we have very much this entitled mentality of like, well, if I want it, I'm going to own it, whether you should own it or not. Mm -hmm. Right. So like I've put so, uh, a few pu like puppies for my breeding programs in active like pet homes. But I know these people are out, they're out hiking. They're on the beach every day playing with the dog. Like they're giving the dog what they want. The dog doesn't necessarily have to pick a specific job, but the dog has to do something. Mm hmm. Right. And you see a lot of like Malinois are inherently like naturally neurotic dogs. But then if you don't give them anything to do, they're going to become incredibly neurotic. And unfortunately, like you can ruin a really good dog by actually just not doing anything with them. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's I, I like I'm not going to compare that to like physically abusing the dog, but it is it is a form of abuse, just like mental abuse is also you know, it's like, maybe it's not as bad as physical abuse, but sometimes mental abuse could be worse. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on uh, having a Malinois as a pet? As long as you are going to give that dog what they need and deserve, I think they can be pets, but the average person will not give the dog what they deserve mm -hmm. and what they need. So if you're saying, okay, I'm an active person and I'm constantly, you know, I run with the dog, I bike with the dog, I, you know, again, like you don't have to do a specific sport, but you have to do something to expel that dog's physical and mental energy. You have mm -hmm. to put the time in to train the dog and you have to put the time into 
um, physically tire the dog out. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, when Rika and I came to your place and uh, we sat there and, and we're chatting for a while and Rika kept on looking at, at us, you know, looking at me, looking at, you know, kind of waiting for, uh, waiting for that interaction. Um, I, um, as a first time Malinois owner, I'm looking at, did I, um, am I engaging with her too much? Is it like, am I constantly working with her? Should I scale back? Uh, I mean, yes, too much could be too much, but I don't necessarily think that you're doing too much with her. Um, I, I love that you're like, I love that you're honest by saying, I don't know what I don't know, but I want to know it. So like, yes, as a, as a newer handler, like, that's what I like. I like people that are like, look, I don't know everything. Like, teach me, please. Like, I want to absorb these things. And Rika is kind of the same dog. She's like, okay, like, what are you going to teach me now? What, you know, what do you want me to do now? Like, I like that kind of a dog. Um, and, you know, like, yes, there, there could be a time where too much training is too much, but you know, I'd almost error on the side of like, ah, I'll tell you when to slow down as okay. opposed to like, okay, you got to do more with the dog. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I yeah. Prefer to, I prefer to tell someone like, hey, you're taking too good care of the dog. Like I saw one, a puppy that I bred um, and I saw the dog one day. It was a, it was still a puppy, but the puppy was fat. And normally like I'm used to having to tell people like, hey, feed that dog more. So in that case, I didn't even say anything because yes, was it wrong that the dog was overweight? Yes. But I know that's because the dog person's taking too good care of the dog mm -hmm. and the do they ended up realizing like, okay, this is too much food. And the dog, you know, ultimately is in perfect body weight. Right. Mm -hmm. But dogs are growing, they're growing weird. They're growing in different shapes and sizes. And, you know, you want to up their food, but you don't want to give them too much food. Um, but yeah, I'm always going to like be easier on the person that's doing too much th and tell them, you know, okay, let's scale this back a little bit. Um, then, you know, tell someone like, Hey, you know, for the most part, it's like, ah, you're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. So yes, in your case, I think you're doing great. If you're doing too much, I would tell you like, yeah, you're doing too much. Mm -hmm. Again, okay. it's the reason why I like Malinois because they're highly motivating dogs. I tend to be a little bit lazier of a handler. But when I have a dog that's like, ah, I got to do something like, you know, like, okay, that's going to motivate me to go out and do something with the dog. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's definitely what I um, love so much about with Rika. And she has been such a gift, especially during quarantine, like waking up and going outside, being active and training. Um, yeah. I think it's so rewarding for um, the, hand the handler really to, to have, you know, it, it's a team, you know, together, either I'm the one that's like, all right, let's go and train or Rika's is like, all right, let's go. <laughs> like, yep. let's get out. So, um, yeah, it's definitely very, very special. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have a few questions from, um, on here. Oh, Jared Wolf is asking, uh -uh. John, did you already mail out my dog's custom collar? John, the leather plug. <laughs> uh, it's going out on Monday. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about your uh, the, your leather uh, collection and uh, your leather making? It's kind yeah, of so ever since I was a little kid, I've always been obsessed with leather for some reason. Um, my parents would entertain me by like dropping me off at tax stores, like horse stores. And like, I just go around and like touch and smell. I know it's weird, but like there's something about leather um, that's always intrigued me. And I always wanted to learn how to do leather work. And um, when I was living in Chicago, all I did all day, every day was work with people. And I kind of needed something as therapy that didn't involve anyone. And so I had a client in Chicago. Um, I, she was a retired dog trainer that did leather work. And I had trained her wife's uh, service dog. And so uh, we would do some bartering, you know, like for leather equipment for my pro shop, you know, and uh, I came to her one day and I said, I really want to learn how to do leather work. And she 
you know, sold me a bunch of like old tools she had and showed me some basic stuff. And then I basically watched YouTube videos and, you know, I've been doing it now for four or five years. And, you know, I just, I love to create. I've always like, liked building things with my hands. And, um, you know, I just like, I, I love watching like the products that I've made actually being enjoyed by people. Like I actually keep very little of the products that I make. Like there's not a lot of products that I'm going to use on a daily basis that I physically made because I like to make them and sell them to friends or people that like are going to enjoy them. So like I've been on, um, uh, I make leather scratch aprons, right? Or you can use them for welding or like my brother-in-law has when he uses it to barbecue. Um, but mm. I've been like a leather apron kick and, you know, as far as I know, like, I'm the only one out there making custom leather scratch aprons. Um, and, like, everyone is different. Everyone is handmade and custom for their owner. And, like, I love getting the pictures of people using them. And, you know, like, it's, it's just kind of like a joy for me of watching something that I made actually being used in, you know, in, like, and enjoyed. Mm hmm that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Just um, switching gears. Um, Anas is asking, um, my dog only obeys when I have food or toys, but when I don't have anything, he doesn't follow. He is seven months old. So there's, there's, I can go over really quick. There's four quadrants of dog training and the quadrant she's using is positive reinforcement, which is how we teach, but positive reinforcement doesn't create reliability. So we have two reinforcers, positive reinforcement and then negative reinforcement. The step that she needs is to find a professional trainer that can teach her how to, incorp how to incorporate negative reinforcement into her training. So as opposed to the food being the motivator, we annoy the dog into paying attention and then we then use the food to reward the behavior. Dogs don't have the ability to multitask. A dog can only think about one thing at one time. So when we basically annoy them until they pay attention and then pay them for that attention, it creates a ton of focus. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, so she's done great till now. She's kind of at that, like, think about when you're a kid, you're like three, four years old. And all you think about is like mommy, daddy, toys, eating, playing with friends. Once you hit like seven, eight years old, like life starts becoming more complicated and distractions start coming into play. And so basically her dog's hitting that kind of like adolescent stage where life is distracting and exciting and she has to use something to create that focus onto her. Mm -hmm. So then he's asking, shall, shall I start? Okay, sorry. And shall I start correction and what kind of correction? So cor to me, correcting is a behavior that a dog understands of what they're supposed to be doing. And I very rarely believe that dogs actually understand what their owners are asking of them. So I, you can only correct a dog for doing something wrong, but they have to know what's wrong for them to be corrected for it. So mm -hmm. a correction should be the last stage, the last step in training is you've taught the dog what you've asked of them. You've then pressured them into doing what you asked of them. And then bottom line, if they then, after understanding everything, don't respond, then we can correct them for not listening. But I don't necessarily believe that, you know, the a seven-month-old dog knows right from wrong, mm -hmm. right? The, the most underutilized quadrant of all the four quadrants is negative reinforcement. Mm -hmm. okay? And can you explain negative reinforcement for anyone that doesn't so ne know? So negative reinforcement is the removal of an annoying stimulus to create and shape desired behavior. I'm going to give you an example. I'm in my van. I'm like, I'm on my way to training, so I stopped at this. I'm taking my seatbelt off. I'm in, I'm in drive. You hear that? You hear that sound? That beeping? How do I get that Annoying. beeping to stop? Seatbelt. Come on. That annoying tone got me to perform an action. It wasn't painful. It's not like my seat started like, you know, uh, stabbing me. It was just that annoying sound was stabbing my brain. 
And then the only way to get it to stop is for me to perform that action. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing of when we go to bed at night, we set our alarm clocks. In the morning, the alarm clock goes off. Beep, 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 beep. How do you get that annoying tone to turn off? Press up. You, you reach over and you press the button. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? So negative reinforcement is an annoying stimulus. It's not a painful stimulus. Mm -hmm. I always equate it to like your mother going to telling you to go clean your room. 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 Go clean. You're like, Jesus Christ, ma. <laughs> the only way to get her to shut up was to go and do it. Mm -hmm. Right? That, that, yeah. That's my favorite analogy. <laughs> <laughs> so with, um, so I know you use the e-collar. When do you start introducing the e-collar to your dogs? Once the dog understands everything that I'm asking of them. So I've taught them all their behaviors. Um, and then the dog is mentally mature enough. So six, seven, eight, nine months old is usually when I'll start e-collar. To be honest, my dogs actually like, I wait till they ask me for their e-collar, which asking me for their e-collar basically means that my food is no longer uh, as high of a motivator. Because as I said, life starts becoming distracting. And now they start caring more about distractions than my food. Now is the time that I'm going to incorporate negative reinforcement. Hmm. That makes sense. They're more mature and yet that there's... The dog has to be mentally mature. Now, with that said, um, you know, I've had owners call me and they're like, look, my puppy is, you know, four months old and it's literally driving me nuts and I'm going to get rid of it if we can't fix this. I'll start very easy, light e-collar work with that four-month-old puppy. Okay. Okay. But again, everything I'm saying is done in conjunction with a professional dog trainer that understands how to read dogs, that understands what they're doing, and understands how to communicate to the dog and to the owner because an e-collar is such an amazing tool. But you can also really fuck a dog up with an e-collar because of miscommunication. Mm -hmm. Because it's a non-directional stimulation, meaning the dog has no clue where it's coming from, you have to create a correlation. And I create the correlation of my voice. But people can create really bad correlations through not understanding of how to communicate. Mm -hmm. So, like, for instance, uh, what was it, Petco and PetSmart, they did this whole thing. We're banning the sale of e-collars. I actually think it's good. I don't think it's good of why they're banning it, but I think it's good because... You have a business that has been selling a product, but does not teach you how to use that product. Quiet. So I would go into PetSmart with my dog in an e-collar and I would get chastised by the dog trainer. And they're like, well, you can't use that. That's bad. And I go, but you, but you sell them. At least if you're going to sell a product, teach the, teach the owner how to teach the dog how to use it. Right. So it's an amazing tool, but it should always, always, always been used in conjunction with a professional. I'll give you an example. I've been doing this for 18 years up until about 10 years ago. I still had my mentor there when I would start initial e-collar sessions with my new dog. Because I know I know what I'm looking at, but I want an extra set of eyes and someone that's even better than me to help guide me on my new journey. Mm -hmm. Okay. So somebody asked, um, what annoys the puppies? Can we have concrete examples? I'm sorry, what was that? What annoy earlier, um, referring to like, I'll annoy my puppies to get them to do something. Uh, early. Um, I mean, annoying them is going to be anything that they perceive as annoying. So again, I'm using the e collar, but I'm not putting it on little puppies. Um, you know, uh, what annoys it. It's, it's like what annoys you as a, as a, for instance, I, I give classes, right? I give courses. So I'll have people will come from out of town and they'll come and they'll stay with me for a week or two and basically shadow me and, and, and I'll teach them. Well, I had someone coming, they were staying with me and they're like, doesn't that, um, a smoke detector, like the, the beeping, doesn't that bother you? And I'm like, what are you talking about? 
the, 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 they're like, well, your smoke detector needs a new battery. I didn't hear it. It didn't bother me. But a dog whining in its crate would drive me up the wall. So annoying is only what's perceived. And what I find annoying, you might not find annoying and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, it's very hard to pinpoint a specific, like what annoys, because every, every person, every dog's going to be annoyed by something differently. Mm -hmm. So I find Rikas crying to be extremely annoying. (laughs) I'm sorry. How do we stop that? Okay. So there's a few different ways of working on a behavior. One of the be- one of the ways is teach the dog to perform the action on command and then teach the dog how to then not perform the action. So for instance, barking, teach the dog to bark on the ma- on command and then teach the dog a quiet command. Okay. I deal with a lot of people like that live in the city and they have loud dogs and the dog can't be barking in the, in the apartment. Um, bothering their neighbors. So what do we do? I have them take the dog to the park once a day and, and, and tell the dog to bark and basically like get the dog to, you know, bark everything out and then take them home and they'll be nice and calm. Mm-hmm. Um, so Phoenix, the alligator. how do I get my puppy to refrain from dominating me? Um, when it comes to dominance, like, Again, dominance is all relative. Um, You know, it depends on like what specific behaviors the dog is demonstrating. You know, is the dog trying to like hump? Um, Is the dog trying to get on top? Like, you know, sometimes dogs display dominant behaviors, but it doesn't necessarily mean the dog is a dominant dog. Um, You know, it means that, you know, uh, basically... Like when puppies are born, they're born with their litter mates. um, And then they basically learn through their litter mates, like, okay, who's stronger here? Who's weaker here? Who's going to eat first? Um, But puppies are constantly trying things to see what is going to get them the reaction that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, like, for instance, um, dogs learn that like as puppies, when I nip, owners they take their hands away right it's kind of like um you go like this to someone and they flinch back ha 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 i won mm-hmm. right so they go to bite the, the puppy bites them and they go ah they're now feeding into that behavior and then that behavior is now going to get worse mm-hmm. right and i'll literally i see it all the time with children right children the d- puppy teeth are sharp they hurt Ch- child gets bit once and now forever the dog the they go near the dog and they're like don't bite me Mm -hmm. right so um you know again that's just the dog manipulating that's not necessarily the dog actually being a dominant dog Mm -hmm. right so i i think that the big thing is um go find an experienced trainer too yes that's always going to be my answer Mm -hmm. um and when looking for an experienced trainer, that's, that's a process in and of itself. Look at the person's resume. Um, if you ever go to a website and there is no resume, um, run far, far away. Because anyone with any sort of experience is going to be happy to tell you about their experience. Mm-hmm. Look for dogs that they've trained. Do you like how those dogs respond? Okay. Okay. And then when it comes to like looking for a trainer for performance work, here's what I do when I want to learn. So I travel the country giving seminars. 2019, I gave 22 seminars. Okay. I still attended six seminars. But what am I looking for? I'm looking for someone that's doing what I want to do. And then I want them to teach me how they do what they do. So it'd be like anything new if I want to learn, you know. I wanted to learn how to ride motorcycles, so I went and took a course by professional, you know, people that ride motorcycles all day, every day, and they're going to teach me how to do it. Mm-hmm. So, Joshua Wheatley, so can e-collar be used to give the dog a higher drive? For example, we take our Mal to the park very often, and he'll lose his drive using toys or treats. Um, 
while training. Does that make her not? He'll lose the he'll lose the drive um, when using toys. He'll get distracted. Yes, you could use the e-collar for that. I'm just, I'm gonna um, skip that question. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Hold on. Let me see what else we got. Um, building neutrality and obedience from mischievous. Um, the neutrality has to be done through dramatic desensitization. You can't, you can, but you really can't force neutrality. Um, I use the example of, you know, okay, um, I'm in a happy, healthy, committed relationship, hypothetically, but a beautiful woman walks by me. I can look, right? I'm okay with just looking. That's all it is, right? All I really care about is the person I'm in the relationship with. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the, the temptation for the dog, the decoys or the pretty woman walking by, right? It's okay mm -hmm. to look, but ultimately I want you to look back at me. When you look back at me, I'm going to reward you for it, okay? Mm -hmm. So when I tried to force neutrality, it was constantly a battle with the dog. When I created organic neutrality by just rewarding the dog by offering me behaviors, they're gonna get nothing out of what is out in front of them that they want. I'm, I'm, I'm limiting access. So I'll put the dog on leash, like the dog can't get to what they want. And then when they finally then offer me a positive behavior, they get paid, mm -hmm. okay? So here's a very typical thing. Um, dog will not take rewards in front of a decoy. Okay. Because we've spent so much time building up all of this drive for the decoy, the dog now, you know, choice paralysis, the dog is choosing that they want, it's a higher value of the decoy than the reward that the owner has. So what do I do? Bring the dog out and wait and wait and wait eventually the dog will get bored because they're not getting what they want, right? Again, dogs will only do what's in their own best interest. So if they don't get what they're trying to get and now we offer them something and then they take it, okay, now we're taking a huge step in the direction of you can't, what, you can't have what you want, but you can have what I have. Mm -hmm. Now, if I take the dog out and the dog doesn't want what I want and they want what they want, I just put them away. That's called negative punishment. It's the removal of something positive to decrease the likelihood of a behavior. Like I tell the dog to sit, I show them a cookie, they don't sit, I'm gonna withhold that cookie. Okay, that is called negative punishment. Negative meaning a minus sign, right? So the one thing that people constantly confuse about the quadrants is positive reinforcement is positive, it's good. No, positive is a plus sign. We're just adding and subtracting. We're either adding a punisher or subtracting a punisher or adding a reinforcer or subtracting a reinforcer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. And negative punishment, like we use negative punishment with children all the time. Mm -hmm. Kids don't listen. I'm taking away your iPad mm -hmm. because you didn't listen. That's called negative punishment. Mm -hmm. Sending a kid to, to bed without dinner is negative punishment. I'm withholding something that you, that you like, mm -hmm. something that you perceive as a benefit. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of people um, th that, I mean, uh, I think, a, uh, yeah, a lot of pet owners um, kind of let things go when the puppies are really young because it's cute and like they don't want to correct. Um, and then the, when they get older, like for example, jumping, it's, it's cute. And then once they get old and they're big, um, it's not cute and it's, it's, it's not a good behavior. Um, can you kind of just uh, explain the importance of consistency and like setting those boundaries early on? Again, it's always gonna, it's always gonna go back to hire a professional to teach you. Okay. Because people always say, oh, let a puppy be a puppy. Well, you're now allowing a negative behavior that you're not going to like it as an adult. You should not allow it from a puppy. Mm -hmm. So whatever are going to be rules as an adult, like, for instance, uh, pet dogs should not be putting teeth on flesh. 
oh, but they're puppies. They're they're going to nip and stuff like that. Like, no, it's not acceptable. If you're not okay with that, uh, with that dog at a year old putting its teeth on your flesh, then you should not be okay with it when it's eight weeks old. Now, with that said, protection dogs, police dogs, like protection sport dogs, those dogs eventually have to be able to be confident enough to put teeth on flesh or people in suits. I'm not going to discourage that behavior. I'm going to redirect the behavior. Mm -hmm. If the dog is never going to be biting, I will discourage that behavior. Okay. Meaning that I can't teach a dog. This is, this is a common mistake that happens is people get uh, pet. People get a German shepherd because they ultimately wanted a family protection dog. Well, when the puppy is little and it's wanting to bite and nip, they correct it. Now they come to me at a year old and go, okay, Jonathan, now teach it how to bite. And I go, well, you've spent the first year of this dog's life inhibiting that bite. Now you want me to now bring it back out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can happen. Sometimes it can't. That's going to depend on genetics. Okay. So I kind of, fall, I can't fall into that category. I have been training Rika not to bite, not to put her teeth on um, hands. And now I'm coming to you and saying, Hey, could Rika do protection? You're lucky because she has such a high desire to bite that whatever you did when she was young didn't, it didn't affect, it didn't inhibit her wanting to bite. Yeah. You're lucky. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see what else. Oh, um, dog, uh, Duke, Duke, um, Sean is asking, how are, how are your um, pregnant girls doing? They're doing great. Um, they are just getting fat and happy and uh, eating whatever they want. And we sit on the couch and we eat bonbons. Um, no, but they, uh, they're they doing good. Cougar, Puma's a month in, so she's got another month to go. And Puma is, and Cougar is three weeks. So they're about, they're about five or six days apart. Um, but oh. it's really exciting. I love puppies. Um, and I love raising litters of puppies. Um, it's definitely like a, it's a, it's a pet project. It's a passion of mine. You know, I call myself a hobbyist breeder only because I don't breed all day, every day. You know, I do this as for, as the love of the dogs and wanting to see like really good dogs go to really good handlers. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's so enjoyable. Now with that said, when they turn eight weeks, I want them to go home to their mm -hmm. owners. Right. I don't want to keep them anymore unless they're, I'm keeping them for myself, but like the whole process of, you know, from, from, you know, raising and training mom and then breeding mom and then, you know, like puppies coming out and then like all that early developmental stage. And, you know, um, it's just like, it's, it's so much fun for me. I'm literally willing to take like two months off of my life just to raise litters of puppy because I enjoy it so much. Aww. I think you do everything with um, purpose and passion. That, that to me, that's just life, you know? Mm. Okay. So stolen shadow. Few people say that no one should be handling your personal protection dog or competition dogs. What's your point of view? Um, the bond needs to be with one handler for the most part. Um, when I'm working with people, I will only ever take their dog and show them if they're not understanding so that they can physically see the movements of what I'm trying to explain to them. Um, but no one's allowed to handle my dogs um, in a working capacity. Now, you know, if I'm in a relationship and, you know, like the, the woman I'm seeing wants to take them for a walk, like that's fine, right? But they're not really giving them commands. They're not really training them. Um, I specifically actually train my dogs to really only listen to me. Uh, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that they're, they can't be taken care of by someone else, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I don't like, like I've heard other trainers say like, oh, you know, we should hand our dogs around so the dog can get used to listening to everyone. I call bullshit. Like, I need my dog ultimately to listen to me. Again, he said protection dog. Like, my protection dog is a weapon, right? Mm -hmm. 
and it's to be the same thing like if I, I own a gun, like I'm not just going to leave it sitting on the counter. I'm not just going to hand it to random people. Um, you know, I have to be, again, when you're training a dog to bite, like you're creating liability. And so, you know, I, I, I need to be in control of all of that. Not because I'm a control freak, but because I need to control the situation that nothing bad happens. Mm -hmm. Because it is like a weapon. Um, uh, is Kat's going to be keeping one of the pups from the litter? Um, I'm not keeping one from this litter only because um, I believe that like, if you're going to take a dog and raise it for work, like you need to put, like, for instance, if I'm raising a puppy for myself, like that's my number one job in life at that moment is raising this puppy and Cougar, I'm working on her French ring too. Puma, I'm working on closing out her PSA three. Like I still have so much to do with my girls and they're six and seven. So they're still relatively young, right? They're not, they're not close, you know, they're not ready for retirement yet. And so I'm not going to keep a puppy. Uh, what I'm going to, what I plan on doing is repeating these two litters that I've done. So what I'm using this is as kind of an experiment to watch them grow up. And then, so when in two or three years, you know, I breed them again, and then that's kind of their final breedings, I will keep a puppy out of one of those and um, basically put a, an entire year into like, putting all the foundation on that dog because mm -hmm. here's the problem is I've done it in the past where like okay I took a puppy but I really wasn't ready for a puppy and I didn't put everything into that puppy that that puppy needed and mm -hmm. I, I almost feel guilty um, you know so like if I'm going to keep a dog for myself like it's it becomes basically a full-time job for me I love it right but you know it's um I'm hyper, hyper focused on how I raise that dog and what that dog experiences and what that dog sees. And, you know, I control all aspects of that dog's life of them never, you know, potentially, never potentially having a negative experience. I don't have to ever go back and fix anything. I don't have to retrain them what a picture means because I showed them the picture from the start as you're supposed to react to this when you see this. Mm -hmm. Um, Mr. Boombastic, which age is best, what's the best age to introduce scent for a Malinois or German Shepherd, for example, Black Power? The second that, like, right as when they're babies. So uh, in Israel, I used to imprint dogs, like I would raise litters of bomb dogs, and I would imprint them from a young age with, um, I have a bowl system that basically, so dogs have what's called a Jacobson organ. And the Jacobson organ turns smell to taste and taste to smell. And so I start them. If I know that I'm going to have a dog that I'm going to start on black powder, that it, that's going to be their job, I will raise them from a little puppy of always associating food or toys with that odor. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah, as, as, as young as I can possibly get them, I will, I will start to incorporate it. Uh, Chef, Chef Calacino, what age do you retire a dog from breeding? Um, usually eight or nine, um, you know, before they're elderly, you know, it really depends on the dog. Like if the dog's in really good shape, um, Uzi's first breeding, I bred him to a nine-year-old female. It was going to be her last breeding. She had produced really well. Um, and we wanted to see what Uzi was going to produce. And so we, we did that breeding. That was her last breeding. You know, so usually eight or nine is when, but I also don't breed my dogs. It's not like I'm breeding them every six months. I'm not breeding them every year. You know, I might breed them and then take two or three years off. Right. So realistically, my females do anywhere between one and four litters is usually the average. Um, you know, sometimes I've bred a female and then spayed her and found her a forever home. You know, mm -hmm. um, it really depends on the situation. Um, I've had females that I bred and then tr sold to a police department and then tried to buy back because the dog produced so well. Like Puma's mother, I put her on a, uh, I sold her to a department in West Virginia and um, I tried to contact and I was like, ah, can I buy her back? Like, or can I just lease her back for a breeding? And they're like, no, 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 she's too good. Like we, we have to keep her on the job. But I'm like, ah, oh, that was a, that was a regret because she produced so well for me. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, loyalty, la familia. Hey, I just bought a seven week old female Malinois. Any, ad any advice on where I should start for training? I'm using her for protection. I know it's, I, I know I've said it multiple times, but find a trainer to help guide you. Um, there's something with, and I'm not saying her specifically, but there's something in America, like everyone gets a puppy and goes, I'll train this puppy by myself. And then like eventually has to hire a trainer, just hire the trainer. Honestly, you should have your trainer before you even get the puppy. Okay. So I always say, Going to a breeder or a rescue without your trainer is like going to court without a lawyer. You have no advocate and you have no one out there that knows more than you about the law, that knows more of you about dogs and what you, sh sh you should be looking at. And you're potentially setting yourself up for failure by not having some, like when you go to a breeder, the average breeder, like it's trying to sell you a puppy. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, how many times have you heard of the story of, oh, we, we went to go buy a dog and they said they would give us a discount if we bought the sister. And now they bought two puppies. Oof. That's a scam. Yeah. Right. It's the breeders trying to sell you more dogs. You never want to own siblings because they know each other from when they were little babies. Right. Now you bring them to a new place and then there the constant is the two of them. I want to take that puppy away from its mother and it look at me like I'm its mother. Mm. Right. So, yeah. but when they're sibling, it's like, ah, normally siblings are going to pack up. They're yeah. going to, you know, they're going to make it more difficult for the people. You know, sometimes it works out and sometimes I'm like, ah, I think you should find one of them a home, you know, because mm -hmm. this is not an ideal situation. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, find a trainer, interview trainers, interview multiple trainers Find a trainer besides that you like their training style. Find a trainer that you vibe with, mm -hmm. right? Because, like, realistically, you're going to be spending a decent amount of time with them. Find a trainer you actually like, you know? I had a, I was doing a private lesson with a, a, a couple, and um, they're, like, asking me a bunch of random questions, like typical questions I'm used to, and they turn to me and they're like, you must hate us, um, you know, like, like, we must be so difficult for you. And I'm like, I, our lessons are an hour, right? I've been here for an hour and 10 minutes. If I didn't like you, I would have been gone at 55 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so like people think they're asking stupid. I actually like it when people ask questions, especially when I'm teaching or instructing, I'm giving seminars. I want people to ask questions because sometimes people are going to ask a question that someone else was thinking, but you know, didn't have the courage to stand up and ask, you know, because again, the fear of being judged, the fear of being, you know, made fun of or whatever it is. Um, you know, I like, I like it when people ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes both ways. Like for an owner, um, like with a trainer, if you, if they're selling a, you know, a three pack and before you even meet the trainer in person and then they're watching the clock, like yeah. that's also not, um, we had a little bit of that experience, um, in the very beginning and it's just that's not a good feeling and it's okay like if the if you don't match with the trainer you know yeah, like, it's totally fine you're not married to this person right right, right? you're they are a professional you are hiring if i if someone felt that i wasn't the right fit for their them and their dog i'd say hey you know i respect your honesty and you know i think you should find someone that you do you know click with mm-hmm now, when I, like, I've been in the stress of, like, I have seven hours to, like, do seven lessons. And so, like, I need to make sure that my timing is right. But if they look like they're, like, constantly, you know, like, here's a big pet peeve is you'll see trainers that will answer clients' phone calls while they're working with a client. Like, if you're paying me for my time, like, you're paying me for my time. Now, yeah. if I have an emergency, I will like profusely apologize, but I'm like, Hey, this is an emergency. I have to handle this for two seconds, but mm -hmm. it's very rarely like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's very rare. I was 10 minutes late for this live because I was so focused on my lesson and I had my phone on vibrate. I was like, ah, it feels like about the right time for me to go. But like I got out and I'm like, Oh crap. Like I, I apologize. I was 10 minutes late, you know, but I'd rather give the people the extra 10 minutes 
than them feel like, okay, I robbed them of 10 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, because people work hard for, for their money. And like, so, and I work hard for what I do. So like, you know, I have respect for people of what they're spending money on. And, you know, I, I'm thankful that they're hiring me to help them train their dogs. Mm -hmm. I think that's been the most uh, refreshing thing that I've been experienced, you know, talking to you and just all, all the, the trainers that I really respect is um, like them not answering the phone or like um, answering text because I am used to people um, very connected to their phones where they will, you'll be in a conversation with them, like in a meeting and they'll just pick up the phone, like read the message. Like it's super rude, but yeah. that's wired. And then you're like that, you just um, are so used to that. So I, I love that you, when you're working with someone, you're um, fully committed to that. I think it, it's important. Yeah. I mean, I'm taking the training seriously, so I have to be focusing like I'll give you an example is I get uh, clients giving me their dog for board and train. They're like, can you give us like updates every day? And I go, eh, if I'm sitting there and like videoing every training session, I'm not focusing on the training session. So you mm -hmm. will get updates, but don't expect an update every day. Don't expect a video every day, you know, um, because I find that like, if I'm sitting there like watching and like videoing the dog, I'm not actually focusing on my training session. Mm -hmm. so. and and also it kind of goes the, the same way as like when you're working with your own dog like training your own dog be fully present when i take my dogs out to train i leave my phone in my van when i take my e-collar and my food and my clicker like when all of that comes out the phone goes away because i don't give a shit about it what's mm -hmm. my training session going to be 10 15 20 minutes like if it's an emergency, like it, 15 minutes is okay, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, that's yeah. been like my favorite thing. I mean, as someone who has always had my phone attached to me, like work-wise, I just not even thinking about my phone and like going out and training where I go. It's just- It's, it's therapeutic, no? It really is. It yeah. really is. So, uh, Jonathan, by the way, we're, already like almost an hour <laughs> okay um are you good on on time or can you take a few more questions I gotta, yeah we can do a couple more questions i have to eventually get to training i'm not my girls are pregnant so i'm not getting ready to compete but a few of my club members are competing next weekend in florida so i'm still going to like help support them and make sure i'm there at training sessions but you know mm -hmm. it's uh we can take a couple more okay so we'll take three more questions so if you have questions ask jonathan all right, uh, Chef Chalicino, have you ever had um, an alpha female that wouldn't let a male mount her? And if so, how did you handle it? Um, Puma. Puma is extremely dominant. Um, uh, will not hesitate to fight a dog if she feels necessary. Um, Reading her is not the easiest. I try to just keep her calm and relaxed. Um, you know, her natural like instincts tell her to want to be bred, but her also her dominance tell her like, don't let this dog jump on me. So um, I bred her to my dog, my my friend Jeff's dog Ryu, who is a professional. Like he's a he's a seasoned male. He's been bred many times. He's produced. He knows what he's doing. So I was actually really surprised that she allowed him to mount her. He kind of came over, did a little bit of flirting, and then and then mounted her. And she was actually accepting of it. And I was like, man, like, this is really cool that I don't have to, like, fight to hold her, you know. If I really have a female that is really that dominant, usually I'll just do an artificial insemination to not put the female through that stress, the male through the stress, me through the stress. Um, but usually dominant females when they come into heat like they still their their nature tells them that they want to be bred mm -hmm. you know uh loyalty familia where in florida are you guys training or uh there's a trial in tampa tampa bay psa um they always host their annual trial the second weekend in january um if Puma wasn't pregnant, I would be going down there to try to close out her, her second leg of her three. 
Um, but you know, I only had a certain window to be able to breed them before I have to go back to competition season and like traveling because I didn't travel all, you know, I still did a few seminars in 2020, but you know, because of the pandemic, I didn't do like what I did the year before, which was 22 seminars. Um, so basically, you know, 2021 is going to be pretty busy for me. So I have to kind of get this in during the winter uh, when I have the time to do it. Mm-hmm. So. Um, okay. Uh, the last question, um, because as I'm going through, there's, I'm going to kind of wrap this all up. Yeah. Um, we can do, we'll do another one, you know, yeah. in the future and we can do more questions. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay, um, Fa Rank, eight month old Rottweiler. What are um, what's what are ways to stop leash reactivity for people and dogs? She's very socialized and only pulls when walking close to people and dogs, especially ones she knows. So sometimes, depending on what collar you're using, um, you could be create inadvertently creating leash reactivity, like a prong collar. Um, the dog ends up learning to associate the stimulation that they're feeling on the neck with the dogs that they're trying to get to. So I get a lot of times people contact me and they're like, well, my dog is dog aggressive. And I say, okay, so your dog doesn't like any dogs. And they go, well, no, he lives with another dog. And when I take him to the park and cut him off leash, he's fine. Your dog is not dog aggressive because a truly dog aggressive dog doesn't like any dogs. Okay. (laughs) Then the other thing is, okay, well, the dog only acts aggressive when they're on leash. It's not necessarily always leash aggression. Sometimes it's just leash reactivity that is manifesting itself into aggressive behavior. Meaning that I want to get to what I want to get to. I can't get there. But in that same respect, I'm receiving pain. So now I'm going to associate that pain with what I'm trying to get to, which will inherently make me aggressive towards what I'm looking at. Mm. Does that make sense? So it's dogs. Again, dogs don't have the ability to multitask. They can only associate what they're looking at with what they're feeling, right? It's the reason why Caesar Milan karate chops all the dogs. He's trying to get them to not think about what's in front of them and think about him. Now there's better ways of doing it, mm-hmm. right? Without kicking and, you know, like karate chopping dogs. I'd rather use an e-collar and just tap the dog on the shoulder. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there are many ways to do it, so... Okay, fluff, fluffy transport. Should a dog transporter use e collars or or prong um, idle? The owner has them on a dog. Um, I don't want anyone using any corrective collars with any of my dogs. Um, so personally, if my dog was if if my dog was ever going to be transported with a transporter, I would rather them just put a slip leash on the dog so that the dog can't back out or get away from them. Um, You know, it's going to stop the dog from really like pulling a ton because they can't breathe because they're being choked. Um, And just let my dog go to the bathroom and put my dog back in the crate and get the dog as quickly to where their destination is as possible. So it's as few times that dog could be out of the crate at rest stops that for the potential of danger, right? Getting, getting slipping away because they don't have any bond with that transporter. Right. So slipping away or a car coming or something happening like, you know, um, I'd rather just, you know, quick go potty and then go back in the crate and then, you know, get the dog to where they need to go. Mm-hmm. Um, on a side note, I ordered the dog truck arc. Good. Yes. Good. Um, and uh, I, I also ordered the larger prong collar, the 3.0 one. Oh, good. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So um, we should do a video on um, proper placement of the prong collar. Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny. There was um, one of my favorite things about the internet is like just watching things unfold. And so there's a picture of Ivan Balabanov, who's one of the top dog trainers in the world, with his dog like waiting on deck at open field. And the dog has a loose prong collar on the bottom of the dog's neck and he has a flexi leash on the dog and these people who don't know who he is started flipping out that's not where you place a prong collar that's not how you do it and oh my god a prong collar and a flexi like 
the funniest part to me was they don't even know who they're talking about, right? Obviously, if that guy is going to do that with his dog, <coughs> excuse me, like, obviously he knows what he's doing, right? So you get a lot of these, like, internet bullies on, like, you're not training the dog properly. Like, collar needs to be here. And I move collars around where they need to be, depending on what my dominant collar, like, if I'm using my prong collar as my primary motivator, communication tool like i'm gonna have that high up on the neck you know like sometimes i'm gonna put a prong collar low on the dog's neck just because i want the dog to just walk with me and i don't really want to have to correct the dog and i just want the dog to kind of like just feel the tension and just kind of stay by my side you know mm -hmm. so um yeah we can definitely go over all that stuff i'd love to um and then someone's asking about a, the gentle leader collar a gentle leader is the same theory of how we guide horses, which is where the head goes, the body follows. The problem is, is it doesn't actually train the dog. I basically call it, it's a band-aid. So it's something I can put on the dog that automatically is going to stop the dog from pulling. However, it's not actually teaching the dog the behavior of where they're supposed to be. So ultimately, I'm teaching my dog how to walk nicely next to me because I want the dog to just walk nicely next to me with no collar and no leash. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to use my collar and leash to teach that. But I can't correct the dog with or communicate that way with a gentle leader. And honestly, I also don't like what it does to the dog's neck. It twists and brings the dog head up. It's actually really bad for the dog's neck and spine. So mm -hmm. I'm not a huge fan. Um, if the option is get rid of the dog or put it or put a gentle leader on the dog. Like I'd say, put a gentle leader on the dog, you know, unfortunately, sometimes people get dogs and they can't afford training. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes like we have to pick lessers of evils, but it, anytime we have the option, I'm always going to tell someone, find a professional dog trainer, let them teach you because if you do it properly, I can't tell you how many times I've been the fourth, fifth, sixth trainer. Right. You know, the key thing is like, I'm just the last trainer, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, like spend the money and, and invest in a good trainer because like that's going to give you your return back as opposed to trying to go with a cheaper trainer because, you know, uh, ultimately you're going to end up spending the money if you want to do it right, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, I just started a training today and the person had pre had worked with a previous trainer and when i showed up the dog has a choke chain on and i'm like uh i don't use choke chains mm -hmm. right and to me the fact that a trainer came and put a choke chain on the dog and was like yanking the dog around like that's real old school right that's like william kohler wrote a, his dog training book in the 80s and there's trainers that are still training dogs in the 80s I say, this is 2021. Like I am training dogs in 2021, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think I, I want to end on this because I've talked about this in lives before. Um, when you're, you know, a first time Malinois owner and you link up with the trainer and the trainer works with Mal's all the time, you're going to listen and you're going to do what the trainer says. But yeah. sometimes that is not the, the, um, 2020 version of it or like the trainer that's going to s multiple seminars um constantly learning uh, so yeah i think that the um owner just needs to be educated too and back what you were saying about like picking a trainer who has the experience and has dogs um that you want your dog to mirror look like yeah. Yeah. That's why I said interview, like interview. If, if I was going to hire a, a, a nanny to take care of my kid, like I would interview, you know, yeah. if I'm going to hire a trainer to work for me, I am going to interview. Mm -hmm. Right. I had a, tr I, I, I forgot about the story, but I had recently a very experienced, very talented dog trainer uh, told me that I rejected her for an apprenticeship I was offering because when she sent me, her letter of intent she it had a different dog training company's name so like i get it that she was applying to multiple places but to me the fact that she didn't realize that she had sent an email with a different dog trainer's business name 
meant that she wasn't focusing on the details, right? And she ended up telling me this story. I forgot that this ever happened. And she ended up telling me this story. And she said, you know what? Like, that really changed me. It made me focus on the details as opposed to, you know, like focusing on the broad picture. So, yeah. The devil. The devil's in the details. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, you are awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, and I'll see you on Monday. Sounds great. Okay. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys.